Welcome back, folks. I know it's been quite a while since I updated not only this project, but anything on the channel. I've had a lot going on. But uh, New Year, we're going to get to it. I've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, in the meantime, what has gone on completely off camera, which I've had a lot of fun doing. Uh, and you will see a walk around video on this whole thing. A uh, Soviet T-62 in Afghanistan during their time in the 1980s. Uh, it's a very heavily done. So we'll see a whole thing about this coming up soon. Uh, with some other projects that are uh, in the works underway, all sorts of stuff. But we have we have a score to settle with this. The Atlantis H25 Army Mule, also known as the HUP Retriever in um, Navy and Marine Corps service. So if you recall, if you don't recall, I'll put a link right up here where you can see part one. We are doing this, and we are doing this for the most part, as most as much as we can exactly, you know, with the tools and techniques that that somebody would have to build the original way back. Because remember, Atlantis is a a remolder, reboxer. Um, so you know, the old Aurora kit from the fifties. We do take a little few liberties here and there, but I want to produce this as it would have been done basically back then. So when we last left off, and the reason I have not wanted to work on this since, we have this terrible fitting canopy piece. And that's basically why I just have not wanted to work on this. So uh, what we're gonna do is, it's, it's actually not as bad as I remember. Uh, we're gonna do some filling with some Vallejo plastic putty, because I think putty was a thing that existed. You know, once upon a time, we can do that. Uh, the reason I want to use this, though, is because it's very easy for us to fill in in the gaps, and then we can use water or Vallejo thinner to rub away where we don't want it and have it remain right in there. What I don't want to do is start sanding and losing that rivet detail around the edges, because uh, that's, that's nice, nice molding there and everything. So we don't have a lot of detail on this. We don't want to lose any. We also have to fill a little bit on the rotor hubs there, some sink marks, because these should be nice and flat. And then we have a little bit of sanding and shaping to do on the rotor blades, but um, that's basically what we're waiting for to finish that and smooth that out before we can kind of get to painting on this and everything. So let's go ahead and get going with this and get this thing uh, finished so we can move on to some more exciting projects. got some little sink marks on the rotors to fill in so we're just going to use the same putty on them and try to get them looking nice and even. Just a little bit of flash to clean up on these rotor blades. It's a good time to do it because we're coming up on painting so as we sand the extra putty, we'll just make sure these blades are shaped nice and pretty. Rotors are all ready for the next step. We use a hair dryer to soften the plastic up a little bit. They're a little wonky and bent out of shape. Um, but I'm going to go a step further and I want to impart just a little bit of rotor sag as these things would appear sitting on the ground. The 
The real important part, even though I think I overdid the sag a little bit, is that all the rotor blades spin free and clear everything they're supposed to clear. Both rotor blades put on here together clear each other. So in real life, as this helicopter started from cold, nothing would smash into anything else. Two major steps to bring us a little closer to finishing are done. Um, I wasn't originally planning to put some rotor sag in here, but the two types of rotors that this may have used, because I, I found sources on both, were either wood or just plain aluminum, no composites. So those plain aluminum rotors did tend to sag quite a bit on the ground. Now, I think I over-exaggerated it just a little bit, but it's going to add a little something to the finished model, and this little model needs everything we can we can give it because it's pretty sparse on details unfortunately i'm not going to know how well the filling did over here until i you know because we've got three different colors and textures and everything so i'm going to need to give it a spray of a little bit of primer to equalize the color of everything so i can really see kind of how we're doing i'm not so much worried about the rotor area but i'm going to need to spray that so i can see if we need i mean i can tell over here we've got a little overbite on there it's going to need to be sanded down this so it's it's proud right there on the frame and then it's even right about here and then we're proud a little bit on the canopy piece there if we're trying to save that little tiny rivet detail i don't know if we're going to be able to get it perfect but we'll see what we can do what are the other quote unquote problems with this model is that we have two sets of rotor blades that are basically spinning in the same direction and they don't look like it now right now they look like they're going opposite right if you look at them but if we put these pointing in the same direction you'll see that the leading edges are on the same side the trailing edges are on the same side which means they would be spinning in the same direction as they fly and the whole point about having inline contra rotating rotors is that they would not only provide extra power, but they would cancel out the torque from one to another. Um, and torque is, if you don't know, normally on a helicopter we have one main rotor and then we have a small tail rotor or the anti-torque rotor. And it creates a lot of torque, spinning action, to spin this rotor at the speed required to actually provide lift. Now as it spins, it, it takes a lot of force to do that. So the easiest thing for the helicopter to do on this uh, the shaft that's spinning is just spin out of control the other way. That's what the anti-torque rotor is for. It's to provide force to keep the helicopter from doing that. And that's why losing your anti-torque rotor is such a disaster in midair. Dual rotor helicopters solve that problem by having one spin in one direction and the other spin in the other direction so they cancel out each other's torque. These ones would not do that because they spin in the same direction which would make your helicopter want to just rotate. Now, again, this is a 1950s era model. I'm just pointing it out. If you really wanted to get technical, what you need to do is you need to clip these rotors, flip them and glue them the other way. I'm not sure which direct, I mean, I'd have to research which, which pointed in which direction, but I'm just pointing it out. What they did was they gave you two sets of the exact same rotor setup. Um, again, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get that much into it. We're just gonna, uh, I mean, it was a lot just to put rotor sag in and they look kind of terrible right now because you can see all the bend marks and everything and what they did do <clears throat> is actually put an, an angle into the blade like it would have so depending which angle you're looking at it from and especially since it's all just green and different shades of green right now it does sort of look like at one point it goes it goes up and then down and That'll get all taken care of once we paint it. So the first thing we got to do is we need to prime this guy and clean it down with a little bit of alcohol, prime it up a little bit. <clears throat> We're going to use some foam to block out these window areas so we don't get overspray in there and just give it a coat of primer so we can really see what we're working with, if anything needs to be sanded and buffed out a little bit and how we're doing on our filling and sanding around the canopy. This 
is a really ugly old bottle of Tamiya NATO Black. It looks gross, but the paint still flows just fine. So this is what I'm going to use for the rotor blades. Here's a look at how our seams came out with the plastic putty. The rivet detail is still pretty good all the way around, but there was some shrinkage as the plastic putty dried, so we're gonna have to fill in a little bit more. Pretty much all around the problem areas here are the canopy before we get to painting. It's not gonna be too big of a deal, but you can see around here that we've got some more work to do, and the truth is it's never gonna be totally fixed. It would just be too time consuming. And Quite frankly, all these gaps, there's just so much underbite, overbite. I'll get it done, you know, okay, in an okay fashion. But with what we're doing with this model, it's just, uh, I'll be honest, I half-assed it. I did, but it'll still look okay in the end. Not great, not perfect, but okay. I'm using this color because I think, to me anyway, it represents the older army green that they put on helicopters rather than the, the current day US Hilo drab green. Um, but we'll see how it turns out in the end. References I found with Navy helicopters, Navy uh, HEPs, the rotor hub is definitely a silvery, brighter color. But on Army reference pictures, there's definitely a darker, more gunmetal, even a black color to the rotor hubs. So that's what I'm going with on this model. Tamiya X22 has just been my favorite gloss clear coat lately, so rather than using these little bottles, I bought this bigger 100cc uh, bottle or 150 on Amazon. I poured four or five of them in there and I pre-diluted it with Tamiya thinner and now it's always airbrush ready whenever I want a gloss. We've got a really nice set of decals that come with the kit. Colors are crisp and vibrant. Everything's in register. What's interesting is these markings don't match any H25 that's on display anywhere. They come directly from a photograph from the Eisenhower Presidential Library. And it's a picture that he was given as a gift among several others. One discrepancy here, if you look anywhere, the actual mule, the, the, uh, the Paiseki mule graphic is in white on every other uh, H25. I'm guessing that when Aurora first put this out, it was just either cheaper or easier or both to print the whole thing in yellow. 
and Atlantis is giving you that vintage rebox of the Aurora kit. So we're not going to hold it against them. We know it should be white. It still looks pretty good in yellow. It's a really nice decal. There's a lot of raised detail all over this model. So it took a couple applications of the decal fixer, but ultimately the decals responded great and they really snugged down around everything in the end. take a moment just to show you what a confusing mess the decal sheet is along with the instructions it's one page it's everything this is it but then again this is what aurora put out in the 50s when they made the kit so this is what atlantis is reproducing it does make it a little difficult to to tell exactly where the decals go because i'll be honest this line drawing does not really match the landmarks and the decals on the line drawing aren't drawn to scale with the actual decals in the kit so to make sure I got everything right I found a better picture this is what the instructions for AMP's 148 scale kit looks like of course it was produced decades later but using this picture as a reference I was able to pretty accurately use the landmarks that were physically on this model to sort of figure out exactly where they should go in relation it, of course it still didn't match up but where they ended up going ended up looking pretty good. But this this really helped me out sort of translate that original Aurora line drawing to the physical pla placement on the model. There's not a lot of panel lines on this, but I decided because of that, we'll highlight the little ones that we do have with just a little bit of a wash. And I used ammo of MIG for that. And we'll see how it comes out.
I just wanted to add a little bit more depth, a little bit more detail, so we're gonna give a little bit of wash on the intake screens on the sail here, and that's gonna be the final detailing and weathering we put on this. So work is finally finished on this H25. I gotta be honest, I, it's not my best work. It's not even close. I got very frustrated with this kit several times. And had I spent more time, I could have gotten a much cleaner finish, especially, especially looking around the canopy where it joins here, where it joins here, and most of all, where it joins here. From shelf distance, if it was sitting on a shelf, it would look pretty good. But from up close, it's definitely noticeable. It's probably noticeable in this shot as it's going around. And this is from, I don't know, maybe a foot away, you know, from, you know, camera distance and, and zoom and everything. You know, I, I wanted to do this, like I said, just kind of as, as somebody, you know, in the original Aurora kit might do. I don't know, I wasn't there. I tried to keep it simple. I tried not to go overboard. Um, I did some minor weathering on it. I, I did I did the rotor sag because I wanted to see that in there. I did a little bit extra in the cockpit because I wanted to see that in there. But again, all very basic techniques that could be done with very basic model materials. No buying fancy stuff that's on the market today. You know, uh, washes have been around forever. You can make your own. I, I used um, purpose-built products, but I mean, you could make those your own at any point in modeling history. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple, nice little model of, you know, one of those things that you don't see a lot of being done in, in scale modeling history. I mean, only now do we see some really only, I mean, when I say now, like very, very recently, some really good quality styrene kits coming out of this particular helicopter. This helicopter did not do a lot compared to some of the more famous aircraft, rotary wing aircraft in, in US military, US aviation history, which is why you don't see it very much. But, um, it, you know, when this kit came out, this was, this was a relatively new aircraft. This was serving in three branches and, you know, the Aurora kit, I mean, you know, originally. And so it was definitely a relative subject back then. Um, today it's, uh, unless you're really an aviation buff, kind of a uh, helicopter nerd, you probably wouldn't even know the H-25 slash the, you know, HQP retriever even, even served. But, uh, and I, I definitely rushed towards the end because I just wanted to get this, this model done. It's been a long time. Um, you know, I have a lot going on and I just didn't have a lot of time to work on it as much as I wanted to, but it was fun. It was fun to do. And I definitely recommend picking up the kit. Um, it's a very, very simple kit. And if you're not really worried about, you know, a modern kit with all the details, with all the bells and whistles, this is, this is a quick build. If you just want to put it together and get this shape up on your shelf, you know? So I hope you've enjoyed seeing a little bit of what goes into it. Um, the next model I do will definitely have, you know, all my detailing and um, all of that going into it. Um, I, I like it though. It's definitely going to look good on the shelf. I'm definitely going to have a cool part of Army Aviation history on the shelf. Uh, I might get the AMP kit so I can get like the real fully detailed one to sit next to it. Just so we can have not only aviation history, but some cool modeling history. You know, of like what was and what is. So, like I said, I hope you enjoyed it guys. For all of you out there in YouTube land building your own, keep building them. Build them well, and I'll see you with the next project real soon.